Pablo Murillo from Genesis Leadership Trainings. Mira, mira, mira. Welcome wherever you are at in any part of the world that you may be watching us. I congratulate you for being here. Why? Because you are hungry to succeed. And today, this message is a powerful message. So pay close attention, take note, and more importantly, apply this in your life. We're going to be talking about an identity of adversity. Identity is one of the most complex processes that we as humans go through. Putting together the notion of who we are. How do we see ourselves? How do we relate to the world around us? Very powerful. The strongest force in the human spirit is to be congruent with one's identity. You see, according to the way you see yourself, you will behave. Your behaviors are an extension of that identity. And a lot of the things that happen in our lives are a product of the identity and the actions we engage in. How we relate to the world and other people is part of that identity. How does an identity of adversity affect you? How does it affect your potential, your ability to succeed? That's what we're going to talk about today. And let me uh, share this story with you. Those of you who may not know, there is a book called Think and Grow Rich, written by Napoleon Hill, the godfather of personal development. He lived in the 1900s, and this book was the first book that had the success principles that successful men of that day used to achieve their success. However, this book, as powerful as it is, and as iconic as Napoleon Hill is as a figure, very respected by all of us, obviously, including me, there was one more lesson to succeed, which he did not include in, include in that book. And that is why I decided to put together this message. And that, that principle is that we must be cognizant not to have an identity of adversity. So remember that. I'm going to wrap it all up and put it together like a gift so you can have it at the end of this talk. So let's go through my, the story that I want to share with you. Napoleon Hill lived in the 1900s. And when, you, when I looked at his life and I researched it, I see that he had a tumultuous childhood. Napoleon Hill was categorized as a troublemaker when he was a young child. And in his county, everybody knew that Napoleon Hill was on the road to being an outlaw. Everybody knew that. Napoleon Hill used to look up to an outlaw by the name of Jesse James. And as a matter of fact, writings show that when he was a young child, he carried around a gun. So imagine that. What kind of thinking must a young man have to acquire to carry a gun and to look up to an outlaw? That should tell you a lot. However, there was one event in his life that completely changed everything. When his father remarried, all of a sudden he had a stepmother. The name of this stepmother was Martha Ramsey Banner. But Martha Ramsey Banner did care for Napoleon and she wanted to see him succeed. So she really put a lot of energy into building a relationship with Napoleon. She even used to say to Napoleon, Napoleon, people got you wrong. You're not a, she used to say, you're not the worst in our county. You are just the most active. Talk about seeing the 10 in Napoleon, right? Well, now, Martha kept developing the relationship with Napoleon. And then she said to him, Napoleon, I have a proposition to make you. If I buy you a typewriter, will you give me your gun? Back in those days, having a typewriter was the big thing of that day. Being able to ride with a machine quickly, everybody wanted to have one. Napoleon couldn't resist the offer. So she said, you got a deal. He gave her his gun. She got him the typewriter. And the rest is history. That was the beginning of that writer and famous public speaker that we know of today. So Napoleon left the mountains of Virginia and began pursuing that success. Okay. And as I look at his trajectory towards his success, again, what I see is a tumultuous series of events. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I know that success, and you should know, that to reach your success is not going to be a straight line. It's going to be ups and downs, back and forth, ups and downs, back and forth, victories, failures, adversity, challenges, glory, happiness, sadness, all of it is in there. But it's your ability to stay enthusiastic between those events and keep moving forward that makes somebody successful. But when I look at Napoleon's trajectory, I see a pattern. I see a pattern of tumultuous events that I think could have been avoided. And when I look at my own life, I see a mirror of what was happening to Napoleon. So let's go through some of those events. When he first, he got a job at an automobile company where he created an educational department. However, as successful as that educational department became, he mismanaged the credit line given to him by the bank, lost everything and lost his job. Then after that, he went ahead and acquired half the interest of a candy company. Now listen to this, educational department, candy company, complete different industries, but that's how hungry he was to succeed. Nevertheless, what happened with this candy company, tensions between him and his partners drove him out of business. Then he went ahead and began something that he called the George Washington Institute. Again, very successful. People were really, uh, he had a great clientele, let's put it that way. But then the draft for World War I in 1918 wiped out his clientele. So we cannot hold that one against him. The whole world decided to go to war. Eh, so we won't hold him accountable for that one. So let's keep going though. After that, he decided to start a magazine that he called The Golden Rule, where he began actually putting these principles of success so that his readers could succeed once they learn from these principles. However, disagreements with his partners and the legal problems that came from it drove him out of business again. That's the second time you hear that, disagreements with his partners. After that, he decided to open up another magazine. And we should remember that open up, opening up a magazine, especially back in those days, was really a tough uh, endeavor to take on. But he did it once, and then he did it again. This second magazine, he called it the Napoleon Hill Magazine. Again, people started gravitating towards his magazine. There were subscriptions through the roof. He was making good income everything. He had reached his success again. But once again, an old enemy from his past resurfaced and started driving away subscriptions, acquired the mortgage to that magazine, and then foreclosed on Napoleon Hill. And once again, he lost everything. Then he went ahead and partnered up with a man by the name of Don Malik. In a smaller town, he left the big city, went to a smaller town. Don Mallet was a newspaper businessman. And working together with Napoleon, they began succeeding again. They had a lot of subscriptions, an editorial column, speaking engagements. Life was good. Again, he had done it one more time. But then, here we go. Adversity showed up. Don Mallet and Napoleon got involved in an altercation with the gangsters of that town who were manipulating the police to help them in their illegal activities. The gangsters ended up murdering Don Mallet and told Napoleon, if you don't leave town within an hour, you are next. So Napoleon got into his car, left everything and left and went back to the mountains of Virginia where he hid for about a year. Again, in fear of his life, and this is what's amazing. He went back to carrying a gun. Now think of that. All the successes that he had experienced, all the different lives that he had experienced when he left the mountains of Virginia, leaving that boy that had that mentality of carrying a gun. But somehow, years later, after he had done all that, he ended up in the same mountains carrying a gun. It seems like nothing had changed. 
it seemed like he just went around the block to end up in the same place, right? And that's what, and that's what uh, jumped out at me. What happened? What was at work here? My theory is this. Napoleon understood the principles to succeed. And the fact that he kept succeeding time and time again is proof that he was correct about those principles. But it isn't enough to understand the principles and apply them into your life. You must be cognizant of your identity, how you see yourself. And Napoleon carried what I call an identity of adversity. Remember, we discussed, he used to carry a gun. He was on the trajectory to becoming an outlaw. Were it not for his stepmother, Martha Ramsey Banner, he probably, probably would have been an outlaw. But even when he left the mountains of Virginia, he carried that identity of adversity within him. By the time we are six years old, we already acquire the values and belief system that will affect us for the rest of our lives. Now, it doesn't mean that we cannot change that, but these beliefs that we acquired during those early years have a lot of impact on us. And I think that Napoleon wasn't able to quite shake some of those beliefs, some of those values that he acquired when he was that kid that used to carry that gun and on, on the road to being an outlaw. So the adversity that I'm talking about shows up to us in many different ways, okay? Now, listen to this. The definition of adversity, a state or instance of serious and continued difficulty or misfortune, a state or instance. So adversity is not just an event that occurs. Oh, gosh, this was, I face adversity today. No, adversity is also a way of being, the way you see yourself. And when you see yourself through that lens of adversity, what happens, your behaviors start gravitating towards adversarial events and you keep attracting that into your life some of that adversity can come to us through emotions such as anger jealousy ego driven fear for example like i'll give you an example for me i grew up in the in the in the civil war in nicaragua during the 1970s and i saw the world through that lens of adversity the, uh, the lens of war and because I saw the world through that lens, I acquired that identity of adversity. So everywhere I went, even when I was, in, when I was not in war anymore, I carried the war with me. I carried the war mentality, the way I related to others. I carry this mentality of survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. And I sure didn't want to be the one that was going to be the prey. So I became the predator. That's how identity of adversity shows up in your life, okay? But let's talk about a little further how that can show up in your own life. For example, have you ever gone outside and be angry and then you look outside and then you notice everything that's beautiful? Of course not. If you're angry, you're going to go outside and look at a sunny day and say, this is too sunny. If you're angry, you're going to go outside and watch a rainy day and say, this is too rainy. No matter what, you will only notice things that are in the frequency of that anger. So adversity is the same way. When you acquire an identity of adversity, it's a way of looking at the world through that bleak vision, that lens that only identifies things that are difficult, things that are in frequency with the adversity that you carry inside. I hope that that makes sense. So think about what events in your life have you had where you have act actually acted in that way. An identity of adversity can show up, for example, if we are fighting against uh, an injustice in society. Maybe we're fighting against racism. Maybe we're fighting against sexism, which is great things to do. But if we constantly look at the world through that lens only, everywhere we go, that's all we are going to see. Even when you see somebody who may support your cause, you will not even see that because you're only looking for people who are violating those social, that, the social cause that you're fighting for. And when you acquire an identity of adversity, 
there is a difference between fighting in the struggle to make the world better and becoming that struggle. That's when identity of adversity starts helping, it starts taking hold of you. If you have an attitude of an eye for an eye, that means you have an identity of adversity. If you find yourself thinking that if he, if he or she does this, I'm gonna come back and do twice as hard. That's an identity of adversity. Now, is it easy to allow an event to occur to you and then take the, the high road per se or act in a peaceful way? It's not easy, I understand that. But nevertheless, when you fall into that retaliation mentality, an eye for an eye, that means you have an identity of adversity. If you carry around a, around a chip on your shoulder, constantly just trying to find a reason to lash out on somebody, to argue with somebody, if you're angry all the time, that is an identity of adversity. All those things are a way that you have seen the world through maybe an experience that you had when you were a child and something that you keep holding on to which has become the lens that you see the world through. And if you stay looking at that world through that lens long enough, you become that lens. That is the identity of adversity. So how do we, um, how do we free ourselves from the identity of adversity? You got to realize that the experiences you had in your life, those tough experiences do not have to define who you become. Take control of that. The experiences in the world, the negativities of the world do not have to do anything with your intrinsic value. Separate those two. Experiences are here outside and they do give feedback to you to learn. Internal value, who you become is your decision. It's inside you. Do not mix those two up. I used to allow the negativities of the world to decide who I was going to become. That's why I acquire an identity of adversity. So it's so important to differentiate between those two, all right? And when you think about your own success, it's so important that you are congruent with being the change that you want to see in the world, like Gandhi said. If you think that you want the world to be more loving, then you got to be a more loving person. If you want the world to be more just, then you got to be a more just person. And when you fight for something that you think is a righteous cause, fight for that, but don't become that struggle. Because in becoming that struggle, that's when you acquire the anger or the negative, negative emotions of that fight. And that's when you acquire the identity of adversity. It's about making different choices. It's about treating people exactly how you would like to be treated. Napoleon Hill eventually overcame this obstacle. And he didn't write this as one of the principles in his book. That's why I'm glad that you're here listening to this because I'm verbalizing this principle to you. When he was 68 years of age, listen to that, 68, a whole life. He was invited to speak at a town called Paris in Missouri. Everybody heard in that town that he had helped other places become more uh, successful by sharing the principles and teaching his principles. So they invited him to this town to sell his course. One person in that town, though, was not too happy about having Napoleon coming to do that. So he literally mounted a campaign to basically destroy his reputation, criticize him, etc. You see the old Napoleon Hill? or per the young Napoleon Hill, I should say, when he was younger, that Napoleon Hill would have heard that guy do that and would have engaged in the mentality of an eye for an eye, would have retaliated, would have started fighting. And what happened was that Napoleon Hill, for the first time, he realized that fighting, getting into that retali retaliatory behavior didn't serve him. So what did he do? He ignored the man. And instead, all the money that he had from the tuition, so that course, he invested it into radio time to tell everybody his, his message. And then he gave that course for free to everybody in town and people in the surrounding counties. And that shut that critic up real quick. That's what turning the cheek is all about. 
Turning the cheek doesn't mean that you're gonna get hit on the other side of your face. No, it means just looking in the opposite direction of what your usual, uh, your usual uh, response would have been. 180 degrees, look the other way, turn that cheek on the other way and get a different response out of you. Take a different approach. You see part of what Napoleon here had to learn and part of what we all have to learn is that in our drive to succeed, sometimes we're so committed to driving, so committed to reaching our goal that we start rubbing people the, the wrong way. We start stepping over people. We start thinking that if you don't work as hard as me, then you're not good enough. We start saying that you are a lazy person because you don't work as hard as I do. That in itself is another aspect of the identity of adversity. And Napoleon Hill had this way of rubbing people the wrong way when he got off stage. He was short with people. And, and then that mentality of a child, right? Having a gun, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive was the same mentality that he took with him as he, as he tried to attain his success. And I, eventually he kept showing up with these partners, having problems with him, people coming back to get him. So be cognizant how you treat others. Be cognizant how you interact with other people. Being successful is not just attaining our financial goals and material goals. Being successful is about controlling your emotions. Being in tune how you want to treat others so that they will give you back that positive energy that you put out. That's what, that's what it's all about, not just about the money that you make. If you're in any kind of services, keep in mind that. Drive hard to succeed, but don't drive over people to succeed. Be, it's not wrong to be ambitious. That is great to be that. But be careful not to become ambitious and treat people and mistreat others and use them as the stepping stones to, to reach your success. That's what being careful about having an identity of adversity is all about. And so I hope that through this message, you can analyze your own life. Notice how you react with people. Notice if there's a pattern of adversities that continue to happen in your life. Because whether you wanna point a finger out to something out there or somebody, you are the reason why that keeps occurring. And it may just be that you have an identity of, of adversity that you must shift from, that you must shed and leave behind. The great news is that now that you are aware, you can take a look at yourself and make the changes necessary so that you will continue to succeed and help others around you to succeed with you. And remember, if you wanna succeed and go fast, go by yourself. But if you wanna lead, Help others around you believe that they can get there too. I hope this resonates with you. Implement it into your life. See you at the top where the champions belong. <laughs>